and James Bullock is kicking us off. Okay, thanks very much. Always a pleasure to be here at this fantastic meeting. Um, so today I want to talk about um, understanding why we have so many galactic satellites. So this is sort of the opposite of the missing satellites problem in the sense that I think we've got plenty of galaxies now, don't find any more. Um, <laughs> If you go out and you find too many more, it's going to start maybe going the other way. So that's kind of what this is about. Um, this is work primarily done with uh, Tyler Kelly, who you've heard from already, and also Andrew Grouse. Andrew, I think, is on his way to Texas right now, or maybe he just arrived in Austin where he's going to be a postdoc there. Um, I also wanted to mention two other uh, talks that uh, are coming up. So Katie Wimberly is going to be talking on Wednesday, um, and she is going to be talking about more evidence that ultra-faint Galaxies are quenched by reionization. I'm going to be talking about reionization now as part of this talk. And then the other one thing is uh, Andrew forgot to mention that Jose Flores Velaquez will be also giving a fire related, latte related talk also on, on Wednesday. Um, okay, so we all know that uh, these kind of zoom simulations of Milky Way size halos predict uh, an ever rising mass function of substructure. And um, you know, this is a remarkable plot from the Aquarius simulation some years ago, where they keep increasing the mass resolution uh, by orders of magnitude, and basically they keep extrapolating this power law. So it's one of the most expensive power laws ever measured in terms of CPU time. It just keeps going up like that, down to you know, 10, to the four, 10 to the 5 and even lower solar mass dark matter halos. Now you might wonder, look, at some point, I mean, you might sort of immediately recognize that, look, at some point you go down to uh, the very lowest mass halos, you're not going to have a galaxy in them anymore. It doesn't make any sense. And there are sort of natural scales to think about where galaxy formation might be shutting off, right? So what is the threshold of galaxy formation and, and what sets that, that mass? So there are two characteristic masses that you might think about at the low mass end. The standard one that most people worry about is the, the, the atomic cooling limit at about 10 to the 4K. And this corresponds to halos with maximum circular velocities of about 16 kilometers per second. So below that limit, um, you're going to need molecular cooling. And then the molecular cooling limit's all the way down here at 2 kilometers per second. And that's like, those things should be really dark. And these are sort of like the first star halos that people who do first star POP3 simulations worry about. Um, this is a different simulation. This is the the Elvis project, and this is just showing another convergence kind of plot, but now plotted um, as a function of the peak mass that these halos had when they fell in. And, it, and everything I'm going to talk about now, I'm going to be talking about, about peak values, and specifically I'm going to talk about peak circular velocities because they relate more simply to these varial temperatures. Um, shown here are the class, and this band is how many classical Milky Way satellites we have, and they and on this plot, if you just match numbers, they correspond to a circular velocity of about 20, uh, 30 kilometers per second, peak circular velocity of 30 kilometers per second. In all the known Milky Way satellites, there are about 58 or 60 of those things known, depending on what you count, uh, are, are in this band. And they get down not quite to the atomic cooling limit. And this sort of, sort of creates kind of a natural expectation that maybe we expect, you know, at some point, everything to get dark, and if so, then you expect, say, 200 total, total satellites if things go down to somewhere around the atomic cooling limit. We know we're incomplete, as I'll mention later. We know there's going to be more ultra-faint galaxies out there, and so maybe we expect a few hundred within about 300 kiloparsecs. So that's kind of the standard expectation. So before I go any further, I want to go back in time now to 1995. If you go on Google and you Google 1995, you will find this picture. Wow. <laughs> Which is interesting because they found a picture of Risa Wexler and me when we were beginning graduate students here with Joel at Santa Cruz. Um, I did not, age, this did not age well for me. Risa did fine. I still have these pants, but uh, I'm not going to wear them anymore. Coral will keep showing the picture. Um, <laughs> but something else was going on in 1995. Uh, this, uh, in 1995, this was the first uh, hydrodynamic simulation where people tried to look at the effects of an ionizing background on the formation of, of little bitty galaxies. Um, and if some of you had, had worked this out analytically, but Thule and David Weinberg did these uh, sim very nice simulations where they simulated the formation of dwarf galaxies, and they concluded here, right here, 
in the abstract that a photoionizing background suppresses the formation of galaxies with circular velocities less than 30 kilometers per second. These things have virial temperatures of about 30,000 K. That's not that surprising. This is basically naively where you would expect things to start suppressing galaxy formation because that's roughly the IgM temperature after, um, after uh, reionization. Four years later, um, that's when the missing satellites problem came into being because simulations had gotten high enough resolution where people could begin to resolve the substructure. And in fact, if you look at the plot from Clippen et al., you'll see that the data start diverging from the subhalo velocity function right around 30 kilometers per second. So it did not take a genius to figure out that all you had to do was evoke Thule and Weinberg and you can solve the problem. So this was nice, this was a nice easy paper to write, especially when David Weinberg is your advisor. Uh, so flash forward, people have continued to look at um, what reionization might do to quenching galaxy formation. And this is an example of a kind of plot that people show. This is from Sawala et al. They're using zoom simulations with baryon particle masses of about 10,000 solar masses. And they're finding what's shown here is the fraction of halos that have any galaxy at all resolved. And you see that around 30 kilometers per second, things start getting dark. And around 20 kilometers per second, things are really starting to get dark. And they don't find anything in halos smaller than about 8 kilometers per second. And again, that's kind of what you would expect. This is similar to other stuff that's in the literature. Just to pick something else, uh, this is from the, the CODA simulations. So these are the Cosmic Dawn simulations. Uh, these are regions that are selected to match the Milky Way and M31. They do full ray tracing. They're doing reionization self-consistently. And they find that the majority of halos with peak circular velocities of 20 kilometers per second stop forming stars after reionization. So again, this is sort of the same scale. Everybody's getting roughly the same answer. Here's another. This is from the FIRE group. This is FITS et al. Uh, plotted here is V-peak. Um, and then now we're plotting the dark, the fraction, just fraction that's dark instead of the fraction that's light. But again, things start getting dark around 20 kilometers per second. Note that coral has run, so these are 500 solar mass baryon uh, simulations. Coral has run much higher resolution simulations. She's finding well-resolved galaxies now down to V peak of 15 and even lower. So I think that's going to be interesting, and I'll return to that idea later. But you know, I'm just going to use this as a conventional wisdom. Galaxies start going dark around 20 kilometers per second. The other thing that's happened since the missing satellites problem was first formulated was that we've discovered 40 new galaxies in the local group. So many of them were missing and a lot of them were found. It's a five-fold increase in, uh, in our satellite inventory in the last 14 years. Something like of order a third of the sky has been covered by these surveys and so everybody expects there to be more. Um, so something like half the sky is unexplored to the depth to find these really low mass ultra faint galaxies. And as Coral showed, if you puff them up a little bit by like a factor of two, they would be there and you just couldn't see them because they'd have too low surface brightness. So there could just be all kinds of stuff out there that we haven't seen. Now, uh, Tyler mentioned this, but I want to now talk about these ideas that have also emerged at the time, the importance of baryons in depleting substructure. Um, so uh, this is an idea that people have investigated using idealized simulations for some time, but also but our, our illustrious chair was one of the first people to show using full cosmological simulations, maybe the first to show using full cosmological simulation that this is very important and you have to include it. Um, but other folks have seen this since then. Uh, this is a, a nice image that Shea made that he will not show because it's using JET. I'm the only one who will show JET uh, images because I have tenure. Um, so this is what the dark matter looks like within 100 kiloparsecs uh, in the dark matter only simulation, one of the latte runs, and then you run the full hydrodynamic simulation and clearly it depletes the substructure, right? You can see by eye everything's, uh, most, a lot of the stuff is depleted and the, uh, there's no substructure in this simulation. The circular velocity is bigger than 5 kilometers per second within 20 kiloparsecs. The nice thing is you can basically get the same effect, including the radial profile substructure, things match really well, if you just rerun this simulation with an embedded potential that looks like the galaxy that formed in this one. 
And while this simulation takes about a million hours, this simulation takes about 10,000 hours to run. And so that's why this is nice, because you can run it a lot. And you can also tune that potential to match anything you want. So you can try to do an idealized experiment. And that's what Tyler has done. And he talked to you about this already. But one of the goals of this is that basically you, you pick out systems that uh, you know, or look like Milky Way halos, and you peg it to the Milky Way mass is equal to zero. So you know that you're getting the destructive effects of the disk in the way you want uh, in these, you know, to match, say, the Milky Way. In principle, you could do this if you wanted to do lens galaxies. You could pick out the lenses you wanted to model and do it that way too, right? But this is just a nice way to do this for a specific, spe specific thing aimed at the Milky Way. So, as Tyler showed, you get a factor of 10 reduction in substructure within about 25 kiloparsecs. So the dark matter only runs here. Here, these are all subhalos with Vmax greater than 4.5 in black. And then you run it with the disk embedded and just kills almost, kills almost everything within 20 kiloparsecs and a huge reduction within, say, 25. And even out to 100, you're seeing some reduction in substructure. Now let's go to V peak of 10. Okay, if you peak of 10 is something more like where you think, really, galaxy formation really ought to be shut off here. These things have varial temperatures of 4,000 degrees Kelvin, right? So there's no, you know, you, this is not atomic cooling stuff. Okay. We already know of 18 galaxies within 50 kiloparsecs. So that's shown on this line. Here are, here's the list that you include. Now, an interesting question is, maybe these aren't all galaxies. These are, these are typically classified as galaxies. Not every single one of them has spectroscopic follow-up. But in terms of where they sit photometrically, people think these are galaxies. Maybe they're not. But these are the ones that we're including. So already you can see that, well, you're just barely there, maybe, uh, if you just count absolute counts within 50 kiloparsecs. At, 10, at a V peak of 10 kilometers per second. And we know we're incomplete. <clears throat> so Andrew Grouse is uh, sort of doing a companion paper where we're, he's using Tyler simulations to try to play around with this a little bit and figure out what it means. So what's shown here is the radial distribution of all subhalos. In, now the disk runs. We're throwing out the dark matter only runs because I think those just aren't right. right? And we know there's a galaxy there. One thing we know. We know there's a galaxy in the middle of the Milky Way, right? Uh, so these are, uh, this is the radial count of how many halos that exist within 50 kiloparsecs cumulatively that have V peak of 6 kilometers per second or greater. This is V peak of 10, and this is V peak of, oh, I should say 20, sorry. This is V peak of 20 kilometers per second. So this is sort of naively where you think things ought to be quenched by reionization is here. And the dashed line is the total number of known Milky Way satellites to date. Not, in, not correcting for incompleteness. So already, it looks like you need to start populating halos with peak circular velocities of 6 kilometers per second. That's really low um, to get the inner part. And we, we also think, of course, that things get increasingly incomplete as you go out. Because it's harder to find these things when they're farther away. Just to emphasize, that's the data. <laughs> Right? That's the theory. Okay. okay. Um, now, we could do something a little bit more, uh, slightly more sophisticated. We know that we are incomplete in the sky. And so, for example, you can pick only the dwarfs now that were discovered in parts of the sky covered by DES and SDSS. So the other parts, we might be incomplete, but just focus on that right now. And then we do mock observations of the simulations using cones that match the sky from Sloan and DES. And ask, over all simulations, all orientations, what's the full 100% scatter you get? And then what's the average as a function of radius? So you see that very simple model works OK. This is a, supposed to be a toy that it is a little bit more realistically mocking some of the simulations, what they predict. So what's plotted here is the fraction of halos that have a galaxy of any luminosity at all as a function of V peak. And the idea that it's 100% at high circular velocities and rolls off to zero at some low mass. And this is actually quite similar to what you get in the fire, at least the fits at all fire simulations. 
And then if you do that, this is what you get. So this is, this is how many galaxies are seen, and this is how many you predict in this model, full scatter over all simulations, right? Clearly, clearly that doesn't work, just not even close to enough. If you do something where you shift the characteristic rollover to like 12 kilometers per second, that's closer to what Coral was finding. Um, you get something that's a little bit better, even still averaging out low, though. The reason why you're close at all is because of this tail. You populate some of the very low mass systems, and this is, there's so many of them that it allows you to kind of get up there. So what's plotted here now is, here are the averages from those three you know, toy models, and here's the data here. Here are the virial temperatures of those halos prior to infall that you have to populate with galaxies. Again, uh, assuming radial completeness. And you see the models that work are all populating, all have significant populations of halos uh, with less than 3,000 K virial temperatures. So these are very low mass things. So that's all I wanted to say. So the first thing, the first takeaway is galaxy, galaxy potential destroys stuff, right? And this, one of the things I didn't emphasize is you see this, of course, in many different hydrodynamic simulations, but it's not a function of uh, some kind of feedback. It's not, you know, all you have to do is put a galaxy in the middle of your halo and this happens. Just gravitationally, it destroys the stuff. Um, just by counting known systems, the galaxies that we know about now, you have to be populating lots of galaxies and halos with V-peak well below 10 kilometers per second. So this is below the atomic cooling limit. Um, definitely well below this canonical 20 kilometers per second scale where people were thinking halos should be going dark. Um, and so, you know, this suggests, you know, are these ultrafaint galaxies really atomic cooling halos? They're, they seem like they're probably um, molecular cooling halos. If so, by the way, we expect there to be about 1,000 of them within 300 kiloparsecs. Because there's lots, and, you know, as you go out to 300 kiloparsecs, the depletion doesn't do that much. You're back to sort of what you would expect normally. There are 1,000, about 1,000 you know, eight kilometer per second halos, B-peak eight kilometer per second halos out there. So that's interesting, you would expect a lot, and of course many, many more as you go out beyond that. Um, so, you know, these kind of, these things resemble like these first light halos, these first star kind of halos that people talk about. Maybe that's what these ultrafanes are. Um, finally, you know, I think a sort of a sub-point of all this is we need lots of substructure, right? We're getting to the point now where these CDM simulations are having trouble. Uh, figuring out why there's so many galaxies out there. So if you start truncating the power spectrum or forming things later or all those kinds of things, right, that's going to be harder to match uh, than CDM. Okay, thanks. Right. So there is a question, which I don't think it's necess anyone's ever actually demonstrated, that the existence of the LMC biases the, sub the subhalo counts. I think that's a, there is a feeling in the literature and I think in the community that the existence of the LMC matters a lot, and perhaps it does. One thing that's very interesting here, if you throw out every single galaxy that was discovered in DES, these are basically ones you might possibly associate with the LMC. You reduce this number by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 out of 18. And so, yeah, you know, it makes things a little better. Anything helps. And I agree. This LMC question is very interesting. If the, if the answer to this problem is the LMC, it makes our life harder, as you know. <laughs> but if so, we ought to know that and, 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 take, it, and, and take it into account.
That would be a very cool thing to work on, and, that, and we, I can't talk about it yet, but we're exploring those kind of things with some uh, uh, simulations with Andrew Grouse. Um, one thing I will mention is these folks, this general group, have tried to ask that question specifically, whether or not at least in their simulations that the local group Milky Way uh, area is biased in any significant way in terms of when reionization occurred and whether or not they're getting different kinds of quenching. And in their simulations, they don't find anything major in that direction. But it could be. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying these are correct, and I, I agree with you. It would be very interesting if the solution to this problem is that the ionizing background felt in the local group was just very different than the global average, and so that would be very important, and we need to figure that out for sure. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they fall in around Z of, I guess, two, two. The earliest redshift that our things fall in is three, two to one. So maybe there's enough. I don't know. Yeah, it's not, right, that's a great question. And I should have, this reminds me of what we were talking about earlier too, that um, this could all be, so it's not that many. So it's about a factor of four-ish that, that would really pump you up there. And if you were happy with 12 kilometers per second, a factor of two would make you happy. And so one of these issues, it comes back to work that Frank Vandenbosch has been doing, where he showed that at least in his very idealized simulations, you need incredibly high resolution without getting catastrophic overmerging. Now, these simulations, as well as most of these other simulations, show this convergence, right? And so we've convinced ourselves that they're right because they converge. You make the resolution twice as good and 10 times as good, and it just power laws. But it's possible, right? Convergence doesn't mean you're right. You could be converging to the wrong answer. And especially at small radii, maybe that matters. So it's possible that it's that. You know, I don't think we know 100% sure that it's not. And, uh, you know, it's definitely worth keeping in the back of your mind that maybe, maybe it's something like that. 